my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we celebrate Good Friday. How can this Friday be called good? When Jesus was cruelly tortured, put to death unjustly. And yet, the irony of today's celebration is that it is the cross of Jesus that God will reign on this earth. That is why Jesus, he was not killed by a sword. He was put to death by crucifixion so that he could be hung on the cross. And from the cross, he will reign over us all. It's for this reason, on Good Friday, the priest does not wear a black vestment, but the red vestment. And also, very significantly, if you have paid attention, that the Gospel reading on Palm Sunday is always taken from the Synoptic Gospel. But on Good Friday, it is always the Gospel of St. John. What is the reason? The Synoptic Gospel presents Jesus in his passion, as a man who has gone through tremendous suffering, pain, agony, humiliation. The emphasis of the Synoptic Gospel was on the suffering of Christ. St. John gives us a different portrayal of Jesus in his passion. He was certainly not a coward. What we see in St. John's Gospel is a king who is a captive. St. John's Gospel presents Jesus truly as the king. That is why, again, it's ironical that when Jesus was put to death, the notice over on the top of the cross says, Jesus, the Nazarene, King of the Jews. It is important, therefore, that when we meditate on the Gospel of John, we see in Jesus someone who was confident of himself. He was in command of himself. He was not a weakling in front of his enemies. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, he asked them, who are you looking for? I am he. And we are told the soldiers were taken aback as if they saw the divinity of Jesus and they fell down. When St. Peter cut off the right ear of one of the chief priest's servants, Jesus told him, put back your sword. Jesus was not afraid of his enemies. He was all ready to confront them. He was no coward. He knew what he was doing. He knew he was in charge of this whole passion that he would undergo. When Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin, when he was interrogated by the chief priest, he was very sure of himself. When he was questioned, he said, you ask my hearers. 
When one of the guards slapped him, he says, What wrong have I said? Again, we see a very different Jesus. Jesus who was courageous, firm, and confident. When Jesus was brought before Pilate, again, what do we see? It was Pilate who was confused, restless, disturbed. He was a weakling, although he was the governor. But Jesus was confident before him. Jesus, when questioned, he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. I come for the truth. Jesus again was certain of his mission. And when Pilate said, I have power over you, he says, you have no power over me unless it is given to you from my Father in heaven. So, the presentation of Jesus is in John's Gospel. You notice that even the passion was described in a very terse manner, without all the gory details. He was brought to Kolkata, he was crucified, and he died. Without all those details that we have read in the Synoptic Gospel. So what we see, therefore, in Jesus was truly someone who conducted himself like a king. Who was on trial in St. John's Gospel? It was not Jesus who was on trial. All those people who accused him, they were on trial. This is the whole irony, the twist of St. John's Gospel. We are told Jesus was brought before Pilate. Pilate, although he was governor, he was afraid of the people. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He did not stand up for the truth because he wanted to be popular. He was afraid that he might lose his governorship. He wanted to please the people. He was afraid. He was a frightened man. He has no courage. That was Pilate. A very fearful, insecure man. And here before him, the prisoner, he was very secure of himself. You look at the chief priests, the religious leaders. They too were inconsistent, full of hypocrisy. They wanted to put Jesus on a religious charge that didn't go through. And they framed him on a political charge instead. They too were not honest. They knew they had no case. And the people, the people supported Jesus when they found that Jesus did not live up to the expectations. They abandoned him and chose a bandit, a rebel instead. All these people before Jesus, therefore, have been exposed by our Lord. This is what we mean. The trial of Jesus that was taking place was a judgment on all those who rejected our Lord, all those who condemned Him. However, this trial continues today in our hearts. As we sit here 
for this Good Friday service, the same judgment is taking place as even as we hear the Word of God. Jesus, who is now raised on the cross, when you go back home or when you are in church, I want you to stare, to look at the cross. That's why it is very important Jesus is raised on the cross so that we can contemplate on the cross. If you look at the cross closely, the cross will speak to your heart. The cross will challenge you and make you ask those fundamental questions of life. How did that man get there? What did he do? What sins did he commit? Why did he die such a tragic death? Who is he? Why did he suffer innocently? If this man is God, who is God then? So my dear brothers and sisters, when we contemplate on the cross, these are the questions that will confront us. That is why today, in the first reading from Prophet Isaiah, we are told, as the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look. The crowds be astonished at him, and the king stands speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard, and to whom has the power of the Lord has been revealed? God reveals himself on the cross. That is how he reigns from the cross. And so we ask ourselves, what does this cross reveal to us? Two things, about ourselves and about God. About ourselves. Jesus, we are told in the letter of Hebrews, he was a man without sin, but he was a man in every way. In fact, he is the true man. Again, so beautifully, if we have paid attention to St. John's Gospel, Pilate was the one who said to all of them, Here is the man. We are all not men. This is the man. Why? Because he stood for the truth, because he was authentic, because he was true to himself, true to God. The rest of us, we are not the true man. He is the true man because Jesus has carried all our sufferings in his body. Although he was not the cause of the suffering, Jesus is a true man who has known every pain on this earth. Jesus is a true man. He has suffered all that we have suffered. Injustice, humiliation, slanders, unjust judgment, ingratitude, betrayers. The true man. He is the true man, my dear brothers and sisters. Because a true man has gone through all this pain. Indeed, again in the first reading from Prophet Isaiah, we are told, yet ours the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. He was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. Letting himself be taken for a sinner, 
while he was bearing the force of many, praying all the time for sinners. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, when we look at the cross, what we see are the consequences of sin. Jesus on the cross reveals to us the cruelty of the human heart, the injustice, the selfishness of the human heart. We will do anything to get power, to get glory, to get wealth, even when it means undercutting our brothers and sisters, even using violence, cheating, killing, fraud. We do everything for our sake. That is the heart of man. That is why in the world today, there is so much killing, not just within this community, in the world. Promoting wars because of greed, because they want to be the best, the most powerful, the greatest. The cruelty of the human heart. And that is why Jesus was on the cross. So when we look at the cross, it reminds us what sin can do, not just to Jesus, the true man, but they can do to God. My dear brothers and sisters, why do we keep on sinning? Why do we keep on hurting our brothers and sisters? Why do we cheat? Why do we steal? Why do we gossip? Why do we say nasty words? Why do we commit sins against our brothers and sisters? Because we have not thought about our sins. That's the whole problem. We have not reflected about what our sin is doing to our brothers and sisters and our sins are doing to ourselves. You know, when you say a nasty word, you don't feel it. But if I say a nasty word to you, you will feel it. The sarcasm that we suffered. When people do you wrong, you get hurt. But when we do wrong to others, we don't feel a thing. Why? Because we are not conscious of our sins. We never reflect on our sins. We never reflect on what we are doing, how hurting we have been. If only we know that just because that word has caused the person to commit suicide, you would think twice. If you know that because of your adulterous affair, your family will be destroyed, your children's life will be totally dysfunctional, then you will stop. Look at the cross. Contemplate on your own sins. And hopefully, making mistakes, that is understandable. But when we never learn from our mistakes, we're going to hurt. And that is why this society is hurting each other. Those who were victims now becomes oppressors. All this sexual abuse, which we read, we know the penalty is so heavy, and yet every other day you're reading of sexual abuse. Why? Because most of the victims, most of the oppressors, they were once victims. It just carries on. Secondly, when we look at the cross, it reminds us of the love and mercy of God. That God would have chosen Jesus 
He sent His only Son to save us from our sins. But you might say, why must God have His Son to die for us? Can't He save us without His Son going through the crucifixion? Of course He could. You think that God the Father is a bloodthirsty God? He must see the death of His Son, the blood of His Son before He says, I forgive you? Of course not. God has eternally forgiven us even before we ask for forgiveness. But God has sent His Son not to pay a ransom to Him for forgiving us. Rather, because God loves us and forgives us, therefore, Jesus died. Without the death of Jesus, we will never know how much God loves us. So the death of Jesus was important for God to reveal to us that He has always forgiven us. He has kept nothing. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. He has pardoned us all. For this reason, the letter of Hebrew tells us, what should we do then? It is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us. We have one who has been tempted in every way, though without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall have mercy from Him and find grace when in need of help. With confidence, therefore, no matter how great you are a sinner, no matter how many years you have left the church, whatever sins you have committed, Jesus knows we can go to the throne of mercy. He has already forgiven us, but you need to receive that forgiveness. You need to hear that your sins are forgiven. And that is why I urged you again, if you want to celebrate Good Friday, go back home and release your prisoners, release your enemies. I forgive you. Some people need to hear the words, I forgive you. That's why we go for the sacrament of reconciliation. We need to hear the words from the priest speaking on behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. That is. So, my dear brothers and sisters, today as we come for this passion, it just tells us this. The power of the cross, the power of grace over sin, the power of love over hatred, the power of forgiveness over vindictiveness, the power of mercy. In this passion, it simply means that if we love enough, hearts will change. If one of your spouse is an adulteress, if you forgive, if you love, that person will change. If you have a student who is lazy, the one to study, if the teacher is patient enough, he will become a great scholar. If there is a great sinner here, if he repents and turns to God, he will be a great saint. Nothing is impossible for God to transform. When there is love, love overcomes all things. That is why in the Synoptic Gospel, the people, the religious leaders said to Jesus, Come down from the cross and we will believe you. Jesus will not come down. He stays on the cross so that he can reign from the cross.